but it is. If you want to look at all the things, and we saw already in my calculation sensitivity, you have to think, consider about things like changes in albedo and so on. If you want to look at, have to include all the factors, then you get this very interesting, the, the, the important um, graph there is down on the bottom left, which is the global graph, and that shows you the black line is the increase in temperature, and you can see it goes up for a while, and then down, and then goes up again. And the really important and interesting thing about this is there are two bands. There's a red band and a pink band. And that shows you, well, suppose we just consider natural factors that we know affect climate, like big volcanic eruptions or changes in the solar output. You get the blue thing. And it shows, yeah, from natural factors, we would expect some warming from 1910 to 1940. But then if you consider those natural factors, they actually would have produced cooling after that. The sun started increasing in output for a while, but actually now it's decreased. And as I mentioned earlier, we're now at the lowest solar minimum in 100 years, and we've still got quite warm weather. The red line it says, well, now if you consider both natural and the anthropogenic factors, the, the CO2 and other greenhouse gases we've put into the, to the atmosphere, what do you get then? And that's the red line. And one of those matches what's happened to observations you know, reasonably well the black line, and that's when you consider the effect of CO2. So you can't say CO2 doesn't have an effect. You certainly can't also say that nothing else has an effect. If you want to work out what's happening, I'm, I'm afraid it, it's complicated. You've got to look at both things. And that clearly shows that natural factors affect the climate, CO2 affects the climate. You want to look at the total effect, then the only way you can match what's happened or, is to consider both of those things. Oh, there was two questions. Do you remember what was what was the second question about? The ice, age. the ice age. Yes. Okay. So back in the seventies, there were some big newspaper stories and and ad bankers saying, "Oh no, we're going to have a big ice age." So what does that mean? Well, I think that means don't trust stuff that you read in the newspapers about science too much, because the yeah, yeah. Here. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Because, no, if you look what was in the scientific literature at that time, what were the scientists saying to each other about climate? And th at that stage, they were trying to work out what was going on. And there were two contrasting schools of thought at that time. One of the people was saying, one, one group was saying, we're increasing CO2, that's going to cause warming. And there were another people writing papers saying, but we're also increasing pollution from um, dust and sulphur dioxide, that's going to cause cooling. And they're, they're both right. There is a warming effect from CO2 and a cooling effect from um, these, this pollution. And the, the, the question the scientists were trying to address is, is which one's stronger? Because that tells you whether you're going to get warming, whether we're causing warming, or whether we're causing cooling. And in the science, that issue was wasn't resolved. There were probably more people saying it was going to warm, but there were also people saying it was cooling. But if you're a reporter and you want to write a story that gets people's attention and sounds like news, well, you've got to find the most scariest thing you can find, and the ice age was really scary, so you write up a story, you just, you just talk to the, science, the, the one or two scientists who say there's going to be an ice age, and you go, scientists say there will be an ice age. If you talk to the other one, other scientists would say, no, no, we don't think that. Well, no, not really. Um, so that, those sorts of stories were generated purely by reporting, trying to generate news by making... Unfortunately, that's what the news do. They want to make things exciting and Nothing's interesting. changed. Nothing has Nothing changed. changed. I agree with that there. Uh, that's why people are here. They don't believe what they're reading in the paper. Now, look, Lord Monckton, I, I, we are going to wind this up because Lord Monckton's got another a function, but did you want to comment on that question? Very quickly, yes. Uh, the first question was about what causes these three really interesting parallel sudden warmings over the last 150 years. The answer, of course, is that those cannot be chiefly CO2 they must be chiefly natural. And I think the most plausible explanation is the one in Dr. Pinker's paper, that there was a reduction in cloud cover. And I shall explain the significance of that and correct some of the slightly wrong apprehensions you may have been given earlier when I close. Uh, so we can tell from the fact that these natural fluctuations depart from the general trend 
that even though CO2 will be, to some very small degree, influencing the general trend, these ups and downs are influenced by natural events which overwhelm the general trend, including the CO2 figure. And that, again, acts as a constraint upon climate sensitivity, a constraint which, unfortunately, the UN has sought to fudge with its dishonest graph with those four trend lines on a stochastic data set, each starting at a very carefully chosen different starting point. That's not an appropriate technique. As to the global cooling, there is a kind of apocalypticism deep in human nature, and particularly among journalists for some reason. Well, heck, it sells a lot of newspapers, that's why. So you will get this, and the moment we kill off the global warming scare, they'll think of something else. Maybe it'll be ocean acidification, another scientific impossibility which they will spin up into a huge crisis. And then they'll think of something else after that. There'll always be something that people will want to make us worry about so that we will throw money at the government to make these non-problems go away. I think it's time we all said, enough is enough. All right, well, now, look. Now, look, we could be here till this time tomorrow. You've all been wonderful. Because of the nature of the debate, as I said at the beginning, the procedure is now that Dr Lambert will sum up for five minutes and then Lord Monckton for five and I'll make some concluding remarks. Dr. Lambert. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back and re-emphasize that this is the important point. Climate sensitivity, how much warming will you see if we increase CO2 by a lot? And my simple calculation says, Unless you think that this book, Ian Plymouth, Heaven and Earth, is wrong about the Ice Age, I got all that stuff from his book, unless you think all that stuff is wrong about just how much colder it was and how much less CO2 there was and how much dust there was and so on, unless you think that's all wrong, then the conclusion is pretty much inescapable. It says that sensitivity has to be about 0.75. If you're saying it's a lot lower, like Lord Monckton is, then you're saying the book is wrong, there was no ice age. I don't see how any way you can say that sensitivity can be low and there still have been an ice age. And we'll just remind you again, whoops, that his key thing was Pinker, Pinker's graph and she says that he's wrong. That he's misunderstood the graph, he's misunderstood what it means by leaving out the effects on long-range radiation and the IPCC, when they, what they said about her work, they got it right. That's what she told me, and she's the expert on this stuff. Now, the last point I want to make is just an add-in here for my blog. There were a whole bunch of things here, some of the questions that I couldn't answer or, or couldn't address at the time. I'm going to put on that site the full um, message I got from Professor Pinker so we can see what she actually said about his work and um, if people want to ask further questions there or disagree with me and tell me I'm completely wrong and don't know what I'm talking about you can type in messages there and um, uh, ask questions or argue or, or whatever you feel like about it. Thank you. Thank you. Lord Monckton. Let's just talk about Professor Pinker's graph. You'll see circled at top left there, 90S to 90N. That means that what Dr. Pinker had done is to take satellite data, both from the geostationary satellites orbiting around the equator and from the closer in polar satellites to produce a complete picture. So all that stuff about the clouds exercising uh, a short wave radiation, uh, throwing it back out into space, you take the clouds away, then it becomes long wave radiation. All of that, of course, is explicitly taken into account in Dr. Pinker's calculation. And yes, a cloud forcing is indeed uh, an alteration in the radiation balance. That's exactly what happens. She measured it in several different ways, both using the International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project and the Earth radiation budget experiment satellite, which explicitly distinguishes between 
shortwave radiation and total radiation, subtract the one from the other, you get long-wave radiation. And what she did here 